My name is James Lavin, and I'm here to talk to you today about what I call the tech management crisis. I've been in technology for, uh, well, professionally for over 20 years. Um, I started using computers about 40 years ago. I love computers. I love programming. I love creating things. I love working with other technologists. Um, it's fun. I love solving problems. And as much as I love those things, strangely, I don't always love my job. And I've had a variety of jobs. Some have been much better than others. The, and I'm not going to talk about any specifics. Uh, but what I've done in this talk is go through, I've, I've looked at uh, tweet, uh, the perspectives of many, many developers um, and surveys of developers and managers and the process. And I'm going to lay out in today's talk uh, some of the general concerns that developers have. Uh, and opportunities. This is a crisis, but it's also a huge opportunity. If you're a manager or an executive uh, in charge of a team of developers, this is a huge opportunity for you because small improvements in your processes uh, that improve developer satisfaction will translate into higher uh, developer productivity, uh, lower turnover, higher retention, um, greater collaboration and communication, there's a, there are a lot of companies out there and teams doing things poorly, uh, but that means there's an opportunity to get a lot better. And I wanna make sure in this talk, which is the first of uh, three scheduled talks that I wanna give, I wanna lay out the problem um, and explain in detail what uh, developers are frustrated about, why they're, they're burning out, um, how they think they should be better managed. And of course, not, not every team, not every manager, not every executive is doing a poor job. There are many shining examples out there and many of the most successful companies do a fabulous job of this. But I think there's a lot of companies out there that are not doing it very well at all. Um, in a follow-up talk, I will go more into detail about trying to manage uh, developers using statistics, um, me measuring individual developer productivity, micromanaging developers, treating them uh, like resources rather than people. And in a final talk, I will talk about positive steps you can take to create a sustainable culture, uh, maintainable code, um, an advantage for yourself in hiring and retention by empowering your tech teams. So that's the overall strategy today. We're only gonna focus on part one here. Um, if you're a developer, uh, this talk you, may be very familiar to you. If you're a relatively new developer, maybe you've happened to work in a great place. Maybe you happen to work in a horrible place. Um, it's sort of dumb luck and don't let your uh, small perspective uh, blind you to the fact that there are great places out there and there are terrible places. If you're in, some pla in a job that you absolutely hate, there are better places. And, Hopefully this talk will help you become aware of some of the issues that you want to consider when looking for a new role. Uh, if you are a experienced developer, much of this may seem uh, obvious to you. If so, it may still be helpful to you to have this talk as a resource that you could point you know, your manager or executives to and say, look, this is sort of what the data say. 
This is what many developers say. This is a widespread industry-wide issue, and we can do better than this. Um, if you're a tech lead or a manager in a, of, in a tech group, um, you're sort of in between the individual individuals who report to you uh, or, or for whom you're responsible for mentoring and upper exec, upper level executives and CEOs and CTOs. And it can be a tricky place to be. And uh, this may give you some better understanding and possibly the ability to share perspectives and data with uh, people above you to argue for organizational and cultural change. Uh, if you're an executive, I suspect, especially if you've not been a hands-on developer in the past, uh, this may be very surprising to you um, and not at all obvious. And yet you have the most leverage of all to make a difference, to change your culture and your organization in positive ways that benefit you and your team and, your in, and the people working with you and for you. Uh, so I hope you will watch and, and take developers' perspectives into account because I think there's a tremendous opportunity here for you uh, to, to do better. Um, and to, to improve your company, make everyone happier, and make the company more successful. So um, we will, I will cite the source on this, but I'm just going to give a, a, the two major reasons why uh, today's talk uh, is relevant to you. Uh, one is that one estimate, uh, which we, I will show you later, suggests that over $300 billion is wasted in this industry every year in developer salaries. Uh, due to um, inefficiencies. Uh, a second is that developers are frequently burning out and quitting their jobs, and that creates all kinds of problems. Um, and we will go into details and get s statistics on that as well. Um, I think two causes of this. One is that uh, managers who try to manage through statistics and, and JIRA and executives who think that uh, they, you know, they can track developer productivity based on you know, JIRA cards or points or whatever it might be, I think this is a big problem. The scrum process, which for me feels uh, a little heavy, too heavy for, especially when you're doing heavy estimation and pointing, um, it feels like a very heavy process. I prefer to dig into problems and just start doing stuff rather than try to estimate and guesstimate how much how long things will take. Um, but when developers feel like they're being rewarded based on points, uh, there's a tendency to cut corners and everything else like collaboration or testing, uh, you know, writing automated tests or documentation or writing quality code that other developers will be able to extend in the future, etc. Uh, and I think this perspective uh, sort of business minded Taylor, I don't know, the, the treating uh, tech workers as factory workers, uh, calling them resources rather than people uh, or developers, uh, and thinking that we can, you know, just move them around like chess pieces on a board, I think is, is very detrimental. Um, this sort of as a summary, I put, created this to sort of summarize sort of my feelings on on JIRA, which again, there, I'm not saying JIRA is wrong or a heavy scrum process is wrong. It depends on your circumstance. Uh, it depends on your situation. Certain certain organizations need that. They're, they're, if, if you're sending a rocket to Mars, uh, you're going to have to have a different process from, you know, a startup that is doing things very flexibly and can, you know, rework something, you know, next week if they need to. Uh, so every company, every team is in a different place. And you have to be aware of that. But I think overall, uh, if you're able to let developers be, you know, to, the more autonomy you can give de development teams, uh, the happier they're going to be. And I think in the long run, the more value they're going to deliver for your organization. Uh, the British Interactive Media Association did a survey and some of the results here. 66% of respondents are stressed by their work. 52% say they've suffered from anxiety or, dep or depression at some point. And th these numbers are much higher than the population as a whole, uh, five times greater, uh, higher levels of depression in tech. And this is sad because tech should be fun. Um, I enjoy it. And many people go into tech because they enjoy creating things with computers. Um, I'll be honest with you, I'm tired, I'm burned out, ready to quit tech for a peaceful life as a peat farmer in Scotland. I turned 40-something and was burned the F out. 
quit my effing tech job. Nothing lined up, just quit. Spent a year in tech. Uh, saw so much shady dealing, incompetent management, bigotry, sexism, and general nuttiness. I took early retirement. I was so burned out. By the time I quit, I was so burned out, I was willing to do anything as long as it wasn't tech. I was burned out the past few years. The stress of full-time web dev, web dev job took a toll on me. I started disliking web dev. I took a career break, played video games for six months. Back in tech now. I'm traveling along the California coast. Met several tech people who recently left their job and are now living out of their vehicle. They told me they burned out months ago and needed an extended break. Big smiles on their faces. Working too much just to survive because I don't have a good paying tech job. I'll start a project and then shit happens and I end up working overtime for months and then things slow when things slow down I'm burned out and exhausted and can't remember what I was doing and muscle memory's gone. Theory, 90% of the women you know in tech are saving up against the day they rage quit their jobs. Almost had my rage quit tech moment this week. Good times. Sometimes I think about the time I rage quit a tech job and it still gives me warm fuzzies. I was an accidental rock star once. Spent months working excessive hours solving hard tech problems to avert disaster because I was the last senior dev standing. It was a con that did not get me respect from management. It burned me out and I'm still recovering. Do not recommend. When I rage quit tech, I can't wait to open a food truck. Um, this, is, this is what I thought tech was going to be like. Sitting and creating stuff. Useful, important, fun development work. Um, you know, maybe with other people collaborating. Uh, for all too many of us, unfortunately, though, tech can be frustrating. Um, working uh, with you, the process, the process itself can be frustrating. Technology can be frustrating. There's so many fr frustrating aspects of being a developer, um, and bad management practices are one contributing factor to why this job, which on the surface should be fun, is very often not so fun. I have a love-hate relationship with things I used to love right now. Never understood the rage quit tech thing until recently. When I burned out from my tech job, I, started work I stopped working for about three to four months, started exploring Philly more and got into photography. Some people just quit the whole industry. Um, this is how I think some managers and executives perceive a developer's job. Uh, developers are considered coders. Coding is not software engineering. Software engineering is a huge area that involves many, many things, one subset of which is coding. I love coding. Uh, nothing makes me happier than sitting for a few hours and just banging out code. And when I'm in that zone, it's it's heaven. Unfortunately, most of mo much more of my time in software engineering is spent not coding than coding. And I think a lot of executives don't understand this. Uh, a lot of it is staring at code, other people's code. Some of the other people's code is very hard to understand. Some of it's buggy. Some of it is not tested. Some of it you can't even understand whether it's working as it does because there's a bug or because uh, there's a strange business re business requirement that you don't understand. Because if you don't have tests, you don't under you don't have a statement in the code anywhere that says why something does what it does. You see what it does, but you don't know why it does it and whether it's it's doing what it's supposed to do or doing something wrong. Um, spend a lot of time scrolling through other people's code. Spend a fair amount of time brainstorming ideas and thinking about alternative strategies, researching you know, other technology that we could bring to bear on the problem. Do we have to build everything from scratch or can we find a library somewhere to do some of it? Um, doing code reviews of other people's code or helping other people get unstuck. There's a lot of different aspects to development beyond coding and getting your Jira cards through the Jira process. Um, it's a lot of meetings in technology. Uh, some of them are very useful, uh, some of them aren't. And um, personally, I find the just-in-time meetings where, you know, I need somebody's help or somebody needs my help, and we get together and brainstorm to see if we can solve the problem. Those are very useful meetings, but there's a lot of formalized meetings 
that I don't find to be so useful and they can often get you out of the state of flow. If you're in the middle of working on something and you're making progress and then there's a meeting, uh, you lose all the context uh, and your momentum. Uh, another thing is fixing bugs. Things blow up, uh, things don't work properly and you get called in to fix them. Software development is not coding. Uh, if it were coding, it would be straightforward like building Legos uh, according to instructions. In Lego, you get the pieces that you need. You get exactly the pieces you need and you get the instructions that tell you exactly how to assemble the pieces together to make what you want to make. This is how I think some executives perceive technologists that this is what we do. We write code. You know, we tell you what to do and you write the code that does it. But that's not at all how <laughs> software works. Um, here's another example. Uh, you get all the pieces you need and the instructions to fit them together. So uh, another example of this, building a home. There's all, maybe this is a way to understand it. So there's all the kinds of different ways that you could build a house. Um, some of them are very simple. So there are kit homes where basically you can, they give you the blueprint, they tell you all the different pieces you need. They give you detailed instructions for how to assemble everything together. Uh, and then all you need to do, all you need to do is make sure that the, the site is, you know, you hook up the plumbing properly and that the, the, the ground is, is level or whatever it might be. Um, this is the simplest possible case. And this is pretty straightforward, but house, house building is not always like this. You can, you can order uh, kit homes that are completely pre-specified, but notice at the bottom here what's not included. And there were a lot of other things that weren't included. There were several other things that weren't included, but structural changes. Like if you want any changes to this plan or this design, you're on your own. And that can, that can make it very tricky. And software is very much based around changing requirements or unclear requirements. Um, Building a house is, sorry, building software is more like uh, a big home improvement project. Every house is different. Every home improvement project is different. And every single person involved in a home improvement project has a, their own perception of what they want. And each of those people is unclear about the details of exactly what they want. And what they want varies from person to person. As a result, you look at these statistics, almost half of couples who have done a home improvement project have had to bring in a third party to help mediate. Um, almost 40% regret working on the project with their partner and 17% have separated or divorced because of a project. And I looked this up because I actually know couples who almost got divorces because they had home improvement projects. Uh, and it shocked me, but it's very common. Software developers uh, software development's a lot more like doing a home improvement project than it is doing, um, you know, building a house from kit or build, assembling Lego together. Um, there's a movie, I've never seen this movie, I don't know how good it is, but uh, there's a whole movie about how expensive uh, reno renovating a, an old house can be uh, and how complicated it can be and how you keep discovering problems. Uh, you think you've, you've solved it and then some, some other problem springs up. Um, and that's sort of how software development feels most of the time. This is a pretty famous example where um, every single person has a different perception of what the project is supposed to accomplish, uh, how the customer explained it, how the project leader understood it, how the analyst designed it, how the programmer wrote it, how the beta testers, the business consultant, the project was documented or not. Um, how the customers build, how it was supported, uh, what the customer really needed, what marketing advertised. Um, in software, we usually receive as developers a very nebulous specification of what we're trying to build, which is an intangible prod product. So the specification of the what we're trying to build is part of what we have to do. It's a big part of what we have to do as developers. And this makes it very different from construction workers. Uh, it, it requires a lot of creativity and problem solving beyond just typing in code. Being a developer is 20% coding, 30% thinking, and 50% just crying at the end of the day. Somebody replied 10% coding and 90% finding why the ID is showing error on line 69. The, 
<laughs> you always run into all kinds of unexpected problems. When, when you try to estimate projects, uh, usually tend to have a, assume the best and then you end up running into all kinds of problems that you never even considered would be problems. That's the life of a developer. Um, we spend a lot of time thinking uh, and we need to because if we don't think, bad things happen. Uh, I love this proverb, weeks of debugging can save you hours of planning. Uh, slight tweak on that, weeks of coding can save hours of planning. If you don't plan, you're going to make additional work for yourself, either rewriting your code or debugging problems in production where customers are screaming at you. Uh, planning is really important and thinking things through really is important and researching technology options so that you don't have to write everything from scratch is potentially huge. Uh, you can save a huge amount of code. You know, so implementing JIRA cards is about, okay, do this, do this, do this. Um, but sometimes you can avoid doing all that work if you find or are aware of a, an open source tool that will accomplish what you need or 90% 90, 90 of what you need and you just you know, adapt it to your, to, to your use case. Um, that sort of cleverness doesn't score you heavy JIRA points, but it produces huge value for customers at, the, at very little development cost. So this is the sort of learning that developers do and the knowledge that they bring to their jobs uh, can save massive amounts of uh, time. Why do so many developers hate what they get paid to create every day? Um, and in this interview, some David Parnas said, one bad programmer can easily create two new jobs a year. So th part of the problem is that we, we, we the, the developers who, who focus on just churning out code and don't write tests, don't write documentation, uh, especially when they write unclear code, which other developers have to stare at at great length to understand what it's supposed to do and how to modify it, uh, or that create bugs uh, that other developers have to stare at, you know, running production uh, code and logs for long periods of time to try to figure out where the problem is. Uh, bad programming can make other programmers miserable. You can even make yourself miserable in the future if you get called in six months or a year later to clean up your own code or to fix a bug in your own code. You, you can have very little recollection of what you coded six or 12 months earlier. Um, so high quality programming, which requires going a little slower, taking the time to write the test, taking the time to document things, taking time to think things through clearly and carefully before you start typing in code, uh, all, uh, taking time to refactor existing code to make it clearer before you start modifying it. All these things take more time. And when developers are rushed and they're constantly being pressured to churn out more feature, another feature after another feature, uh, these things get skipped and the code base gets worse and worse and worse and more unpleasant to work in, more difficult to modify, and developers quit. And then you bring in new developers who don't have any context or knowledge and they have to relearn everything from scratch and there's no tests and there's no documentation. It's a vicious circle, a vicious cycle. So. Um, this is sort of a couple of memes about development on the left. Uh, we, you know, often we have to turn out a feature even when you know other things are on fire. Uh, there's always too much work to be done in many jobs, um, and there's lots of meetings uh, that take, pull us away from actually solving problems. Uh, People, ha I'm not the first person to point these things out. Many people have been saying these things for a long time. So let me share some of uh, what other people have said. So first, there might be a faster way to burn money than hiring and then mismanaging software engineers, but I haven't seen it. The typical mismanagement playbook is to hire oodles of expensive software engineers and then deploy plenty of pro project, product, and other managers to make sure they don't stray off the plan. Whereas Steve Jobs said, it doesn't make sense to hire smart people and tell them what to do. We hire smart people so they can tell us what to do. Um, this, this is a great article. I'm going to give a couple quotes from it. But this is, he, he makes the argument there are basically that software engineering companies in Silicon Valley tend to derive much more value from developers and treat them much better, give them more autonomy and higher pay than uh, sort of non-tech-focused companies. Uh, 
he, he argues that this is the recipe that uh, successful tech companies use. One is giving software engineers autonomy. Second is treating them as curious problem solvers, not as mindless resources. Um, they give them tra transparency into everything the company does. They expose them to the business and business metrics so that they become part of the problem solving community rather than just people doing Jira tickets. Uh, they encourage engineers to talk with each other rather than talk to their managers and have their managers talk to other managers who talk to other developers, etc. So more, you know, more, less hierarchy. Uh, they invest, this is a key one, invest in a less frustrating developer experience, and we'll go into that in a second. And they use developers for higher, to, they get more leverage from their developers uh, by giving them higher autonomy. So Silicon Valley like companies think of engineers as value generators and creative problem solvers. Traditional companies think of them as factory workers. A factory worker has a very well-defined added value that you, can, that you can plan for. A creative problem solver, on the other hand, can bring in 10x that value when utilized properly. It makes sense to pay them more, give them more freedom, and as this is how you enable them to contribute more value, business value. So hire smart people and let them use their brains. So instead of handing them tasks to do, do this, do that, you know, do this Jira card, knock off that Jira card, add this feature. Uh, instead, explain what the, the objectives are and what the customer wants, and then give them time to you know, implement stuff that addresses those objectives and customer needs. Um, instead of managing people by telling them what to do, support them and mentor them. And instead of trying to, you know, manipulate people, incentivize them through carrots and sticks, just create a healthy workplace. Make it, make it so that they don't spend half of their days doing things that, that drive them crazy. Um, developers want to be productive. Uh, there's actually, I will show you some data in a little bit that shows that developers want literally nothing more than to make progress during the day. They want to make meaningful progress on their work. And so, your number one goal as a manager should be helping your, your people make meaningful work. Uh, and that may not entail sitting in lots of meetings. So what do developers want? What, what do developers think is the kind of manager who would help them excel uh, and accomplish the most in their jobs and be happiest? Uh, because those things are the same. I, th I think uh, some managers seem to think that uh, happy developers somehow means less productive developers, and I think it's quite the opposite. So let's look at what, uh, conveniently, Adam Wathen, who created Tailwind CSS, just this morning posted the question, who's the best manager you ever had and what made them so great? And very consistent set of answers. Most of these answers had uh, repeat, uh, basically like no micromanagement was listed by like half the people. Uh, it was um, pretty, pretty clear consensus about what developers believe makes a quality manager. So one was no micromanaging, uh, hands-offness, trust. Trust came up over and over again. Uh, excellent mentor, never got assigned stuff, but pick up whatever we feel like. So, so some autonomy, some freedom to, to say, I'd rather work on this thing than that thing. Uh, protected us from pressure and stress so we could focus on our jobs. Notice it doesn't say protected us from pressure and stress so we could relax and, and not accomplish much. It's that they, this pressure and the stress was preventing them from doing their jobs uh, or doing their jobs well. Um, invest in our personal and professional growth. Um, some companies are so focused on churning out feature after feature that developer uh, satisfaction, developer growth, developer learning uh, gets stunted and uh, Long-term employment in this industry requires continual learning, and if you're in a job that doesn't allow you to grow, uh, it's really bad for your career, and people will get frustrated and quit over that. Manage to get things done by focusing on developer happiness rather than developer product productivity. Uh, I love this the most, and, and, I th and I think this is really close to a core insight, which is that if developers are happy, that means that the code base, base is healthy, which means it's easy to develop in and extend. Uh, conversely, when developers are miserable, that means there's a lot of things standing in the way of their being productive. And if you allow technical debt to accumulate, uh, the more 
difficult it becomes for developers to do their jobs and be productive, and that makes them unhappy, and it means that they're not as, they're not as productive. Um, so by allowing developers uh, the time to write the code well, to test it well, uh, to document it however is necessary, that makes them happier, uh, especially in the long term, and that makes them more productive, especially in the long term. Uh, you can have a short-term trade-off, and that's the whole concept of technical debt, where you say, right now, we just don't have time to do tests or documentation. We're just going to skip those things. We're going to just push out the product because it's critical to get out the door today. But if you keep doing that over and over again, and you never go back and give, go and fix up the technical debt, uh, the bill gets higher and higher, and you're, you're paying, and basically, and effectively, you're paying an interest rate over time that keeps growing. And, and your developers become miserable, they quit, uh, and it's a, it's a really bad snowball. Uh, my manager trusted me, listened, had our backs. Uh, similarly, empathy, soft skills were things that many developers cited about their favorite managers. They bring out the best in everyone while having a lot of fun. Coding should be fun. Uh, working on a team of developers who are making progress should be very fun. And if it's not, it's probably because there's a lot of things standing in the way of making uh, meaningful, regular progress. Always has and assumes good intentions. Um, sometimes, you know, developers get stuck on something for a while. Um, yelling at them about it uh, seldom helps because usually they've tried very hard to do whatever it is they were trying to do and they got stuck because sometimes things are hard. Um, Able to help out and get you unstuck. Uh, that's another sign of a, a, a great leader, a great mentor, somebody who uh, gives you advice when you need it, gives you ways to get yourself moving again when you're stuck. Um, so, so this is one of the ironies. I think some, some managers and executives especially seem to feel that giving developer auto developers autonomy means they're going to slack off and they're not going to accomplish as much when the reality is quite the opposite. When you give autonomy to developers, skilled developers who, who care about their craft and want to do a good job, uh, they're gonna create more value for you and they're gonna be happier at the same time. And over the long term, the dividends are really high because they'll be more creative. Uh, they will get rid of the technical debt that slows down development over time. So smart Silicon Valley-like companies uh, do provide greater autonomy to their developers and they get rewarded for it. The developers are much more productive. They're able to make a higher salary even though the company's still getting even more in profit from them than the companies that treat developers like um, factory workers. Uh, this person um, had several miserable tech jobs, decided to quit tech. The only reason I ended up working in tech another year and a half is I got lucky and ended up with ended up contracting for Apple with an amazing manager and supportive team who put their actions where their mouth is in regards to supporting contractors and employees. That's one thing. Companies often talk a good game, and then when you get in the door, uh, their actions don't back up. Uh, you know, like promises that oh you'll have training, uh, and then they just work you rather than actually provide you opportunities to train. That's happened to me. Um, anyway, during my five plus years in the tech industry, what I witnessed is the way to become a long-term iconic company like Apple is not forcing whiteboard interviews or sucking the life out of your contractors with microaggressions, but actually supporting the people who work with you. Um, it's a better long-term strategy and companies uh, like Apple apparently uh, that take this approach, they do quite well. Actually, I just noticed they became a $3 trillion company today, I believe. So um, it seems to be working pretty well for Apple. Um, let's talk about technical debt. Uh, technical debt, this uh, Chris Oliver wrote, is, was so bad on his first job that he quit after three months and wrote a whole article about it. Um, Steve Klabnik says, uh, there, there was a famous developer in the early days of the Ruby and Rails community called Y, and he thinks technical debt's one of the reasons why he quit. He just suddenly, he created all this great stuff, and then he, he stopped and nobody knows why it was a mystery, but he thinks technical debt was part of the reason. Um, technical debt comes usually because developers are getting pushed to push stuff out the door quickly. 
So in this cartoon, these this this Vincent uh, Daniel uh, has some really fabulous cartoons. I encourage you to check out his web website. Um, this one here, you know, he, 2002 never finished. So projects that sort of get half completed um, or things where the developer knows they should have refactored the code and just stuck a to do on there and never got back to it. Uh, impossible deadline zone uh, the, when. When developers are pushed uh, hard, they cut corners. And when they cut corners, technical debt accumulates. Fixing technical debt is often seen as a cost center. This is another place where executives tend to misunderstand or mis perceive things very differently from how developers do, and I think to their detriment. Uh, fixing technical debt is often seen as a cost center, a time suck that takes away from feature work. After all, when there are features to ship and clients to satisfy, taking the team off such projects so they can rewrite what already works is seen as silly, costly, or foolish. Developers hate technical debt. It's annoying, it's frustrating, and the struggle to find time to fix it is constant. Developers hate technical debt because it makes their jobs harder, which means slower progress. It makes solving other problems harder. Technical debt, from a developer perspective, really sucks. The problem is that frustrated developers are unhappy developers. Unhappy developers have a tendency to quit. And given the fact that hiring developers is tough under the best of circumstances, this means technical debt's actually costing your team skilled developers, and this costs you money. Um, developers have an option to quit. Overheard. You're just, uh, you're just racking up technical debt you're going to pay later. No, I'm going to quit. It's like technical bankruptcy. So developers have an option to just quit and not deal with the... If, if you don't let them fix up the technical debt, they're going to get frustrated and some of them are going to eventually quit. You don't have the ability to quit as the, the company. Um, you, know, if you, ha you have to deal with the code, whether all your developers quit or not. Um, AWS, uh, a few years ago, was bragging in an ad about a builder you know, working late into the night, drinking tons of coffee, and managing to churn something out. And somebody replied, leaving a trail of organizational and technical debt that their coworkers will have to clean up for years after the builder has burned out and quit. You sure aren't making any effort to combat the perception Amazon's a terrible place to work. Uh, this cartoon says, uh, well, this person used the cartoon to suggest that uh, there's multiple ways for developers to deal with technical debt. Um, one is if the company fails, you don't have to worry about it. Uh, if you quit, it's not your problem. If you get moved to a different job within the company, it's not your problem anymore more either. Uh, if you get fired, it's not your problem. So. For developers, developers are passionate about getting rid of technical debt and making the code base easy to use, but they're often prevented from doing so by management who just want to churn out more features. Um, but ironically, developers are the ones who have the ability to escape the code more easily than the company does, because the code's still going to be there uh, even if your developers aren't. You're going to have to bring in new developers who don't even understand the issues or how to, to fix the debt. Um, Dan product managers who don't mind technical debt but don't want downtime bugs or reduced delivery speed quit. You don't understand software development. Uh, my very flexible rule of thumb, if a chief information officer, old school, tons of tech debt, efficiency focus, clueless about engineering product. If a chief technology officer, less tech debt but still focused on velocity, how fast is the team moving? Likely a feature factory, clueless about product. So what can be done? I really like this suggestion. So this article says Start startups need to stop dividing tech and product. And he says, my first instinct when he had his startup was to hire a chief technology officer and a chief product officer. But after I modeled how separate tech and product functions were likely to evolve, I realized this false division between them isn't helpful for the fast growing startups of today. My conclusion? Hire a CPTO, a chief product and technology officer. Then you have one person who's responsible for doing the trade-off. Because technical debt isn't bad in and of itself. It becomes worse over time if you let it accumulate and fester. But there are times when it's very wise to invest in, to build up some technical debt if you have short-term ob objectives that you have to achieve. But if you don't go back and clean it up uh, and you just keep letting it pile up and pile up, uh, it's going to hurt you very badly. Um, I, I like to think of tests. Uh, when I look at a new code base for the first time, the first thing I try to do is go look at the tests because the tests 
if they're there and they're written well, they tell you what the code is supposed to do. Um, the code itself can't tell you what the code's supposed to do. The code can only tell you what the code actually does. Um, to understand what the code is supposed to do and whether it's doing it, you need the tests. And I think of testing and code as like double entry bookkeeping, where uh, whenever you make a change to the debit side, you also make a corresponding change to the credit side. Uh, so having the test tells you what the code's supposed to do. The codes themselves, the code itself tells you what it actually does. And those things need to match. And if they don't match, you have a problem. Just like in accounting, if the credits and debits don't add, uh, don't equal each other, you have a problem. Um, without tests, how do you know what the code is supposed to do, whether your code works correctly, or whether code changes you just made just broke something? Uh, tests are invaluable for all these reasons. And I have worked in code bases without tests or with almost no tests. And the reason is either because the developer didn't care about writing tests, they didn't see the value of them, or much more likely because they felt tremendous time pressure to just push out features without the tests. And you pay a, after that feature gets that rolled out the door, without the tests, you pay a tax every single time you change the code because you risk breaking the code and not knowing you broke it. And uh, as the code base grows, it becomes harder and harder to identify the source of, of the bugs and the breakage. Tech debt root causes might be just technical, but they usually stem from organizational or cultural debts, uh, like this chart. Um, if, and then there's a, somebody was talking about why people in tech burn out. Probably burnout is due to company, team, or project culture. The person who burns out is your canary, the canary in your coal mine. Uh, when that happens, get an outside consultant to help facilitate a retrospective of the last few months and define corrective measures for the culture and recovery plans for the team. When somebody burns out, the best you can do is give them time to recover and give them hope that the team is not going to burn them out again, which requires taking the cultural problem and organizational problem seriously and really trying to fix it. So when somebody burns out on your team, uh, you better take that seriously because that means something is wrong and it's usually upstream in the culture or the organization. This is a study by Stripe. Uh, Stripe in 2018 uh, did an analysis of software efficiency and inefficiencies and found, uh, well, bad code is a very narrow definition. By bad code, uh, it means just buggy code that, you know, you have to debug. Um, but it says that uh, bad code itself is co cost companies $85 billion a year. Um, uh, maintenance issues uh, is a broader category. So it says the average developer spends more than 17 hours a week dealing with maintenance issues, including debugging and refactoring. They spend approximately four hours a week on bad code. The bad code alone is, is costs about $85 billion, according to Stripe's calculations. Um, nearly two-thirds of developers agree this is excessive and believe that clear prioritization, responsibilities, and long-term product goals would improve their own productivity. Now, here's the headline number from my perspective. When you take into account not just bad code, but uh, all the software inefficiencies from, you know, buggy code and poorly structured code, um, it's a $300 billion a year problem through inefficiencies of developers. And that's the stuff that makes developers frustrated at the same time. There's a, there's a direct cost to companies of having developers be inefficient and waste a lot of time doing it. And then there's an indirect cost because the developers get frustrated and that may lead to them quitting and uh, having to bring in new developers who have, uh, have to learn the code base from scratch. Uh, Step Size has a study here um, which found that 51% of engineers left or considered leaving their job because of technical debt. Uh, this is also from the Stripe study. Um, you'll see that these are the sort of things uh, they, they asked developers, which do you think is hindering productivity at your company the most, developer productivity? And they said technical debt and maintenance of legacy systems. Uh, Prioritization of tasks and projects and building custom technology. Those are the, the headline items. And how much of a negative impact does each of the following have on your personal morale? Work overload 
over four fifths of developers, uh, it's a huge issue for their morale. Uh, changing priorities, resulting in discarded code or time wasted. Not given, being given sufficient time to fix poor quality code. Spending too much time on legacy systems. Paying down technical debt. So when you allow the technical debt to accumulate, developers hate that. And it, it wastes their time, it makes them less productive, and it makes them miserable, which may lead them to quit. One of the things that I hate about JIRA is that, so this is another dimension, this isn't technical debt, we're moving on to another issue uh, that managers hopefully will understand better after this talk. Uh, one thing I hate about JIRA is that the only one person can be assigned to a task. The system actually tracks the productivity of that person. This feature flies in the face of, of collaboration, of team collaboration and can actively destroy the team. So. If you have people collaborating on a card, only one of them gets official formal credit for having worked on it. And uh, that reduces incentives for developers to collaborate. And it also very much skews the perception, anyone who's looking at statistics on who's accomplishing what. I mean, the fact is Jira cards are only a very small subset of what developers actually do. But even there, the data is really skewed because you only gives one developer credit for any card that goes through the system, no matter how many people work on that card. Um, Big Brother management that monitors individuals through JIRA will destroy any ability the organization has, sorry, agility the organization has. And it doesn't have much if this sort of garbage is going on. Monitoring individual productivity is the antithesis of trust. And we heard earlier how much developers care about trust. If the org actually trusted the teams, they would let the teams figure out how to manage their own productivity and do what the teams told them to do in order to make system systemic improvements. Um, so this is something uh, that I wrote about many years ago when I did my PhD. One of these, I studied labor economics and one of the subjects I studied was uh, what I ended up calling high performance work organizations. And I did empirical analysis of high performance work organizations across lots of fields. And, uh, one of the things that was clear was how critical collaboration, mentoring, um, training, all these sorts of things were to building quality teams. Uh, you weren't just collecting a bunch of in talented individuals. A few years later, I actually ended up writing a couple of books about management secrets to the New England Patriots uh, that sort of took my, t this, everyone now knows the Patriots are immensely successful, but at the time they had just won a couple, they had gone from being a very mediocre at best team for decades to suddenly winning a couple of Super Bowls. And I wrote uh, a couple of books because I was blown away by how much the organization matched what I had studied or come up with, uh, concluded from my dissertation research about high performance work organizations. I realized Belichick's Patriots were a high performance work organization. So I wrote a couple of books about that. Um, what do high performance work organizations do? Uh, if it's not top-down management, you know, Bill Belichick doesn't have time to monitor what everybody's doing every day. And that's not how the Patriots work. Uh, the Patriots, one of their main secrets is that they have mutual accountability and positive peer pressure. So players are pushing each other in positive ways. Um, there's a, a really good book called The Captain Class talking about the critical value. Uh, they looked at the most successful sports teams uh across many sports over the past like 80 years or something and tried to identify the factors. And they found that one of the hugely critical factors that you had a low profile but hugely influential within the locker room player on each of those teams who kept everybody in line and motivated everyone. Um, I've been watching this, uh, this really, really good series on ESPN called Man in the Arena. It's, it's by Tom Brady and about the Patriots uh, over the last couple decades. Uh, highly recommend it to you, but let me share some quotes from one particular episode. Oh. Tom, Tom said, you have to put people around you who are going to help you be the best you can be. You weren't held accountable by the coach. You weren't held accountable by the fans. You were held accountable by the guy that was sitting next to you every day. You don't want to do it by yourself. You can't. It's impossible. You're embracing players who come in and bring their energy and enthusiasm to the team because it's just going to make you better because you need to be accountable to them too. 
we'd always say to our teammates, you're not going to get an edge on me. I'm going to work you. We were the edgers. So they were constantly pushing each other, teasing each other uh, about I'm doing more than you are. So Teddy Bruschi said, it wasn't about the more that you can do. It was about who could do the most. This is what I did. What did you do? Or when somebody's leaving the building, are you leaving already? Um, Tom Brady again. You think you're coming to the weight room at 6.30 in the morning? I've already got half an hour on you. You only watched an hour of film today? I watched three. So bragging about their productivity to each other, to, to push each other in positive ways to make the whole team stronger. That's what great teams do. Mike Vrabel, who's a linebacker on those, those great Patriots teams of the early Belichick era. Still not doing the extra, huh? I'm getting the edge on you today. So I mentioned earlier that developers have to train. Uh, the field is constantly evolving. Technology is constantly train, changing. So most developers have to keep learning because there's no other way. If you don't keep learning, you're going to fall behind because the field just keeps pushing forward. So learning is something that most developers enjoy doing or at least are willing to do because they know it's pretty much part of our job description. But not every job gives us the opportunity to learn on the job. Uh, and that makes it really difficult on developers when you're constantly pushed to push out feature after feature after feature and never given an opportunity to learn. The tech industry wants to make it as hard as possible to get to the senior level, but only wants to hire sen senior developers. Um, as much as I loathe general anti-capitalist Twitter, this is capitalism in action. It's pure cost externalization. It's terrible. So basically everyone wants every, all the other companies to train developers and they want to bring in the the already super knowledgeable person rather than give anybody time to, to learn anything on the job. They just want output. They don't care about the developer's own learning and growth. Uh, hiring in tech, only hire senior devs. Make the code base a nightmare to manage. Seniors are too expensive, replace them with juniors. Give juniors no training or support. Things inevitably break. Only hire seniors again because juniors can't be trusted. The system is broken. Um, some more research. We asked remote employees if they ever complete training outside of their working hours. 82% said yes. 25% uh, of all respondents said they complete training outside of working hours because I think everyone's a remote developer now in the COVID age, but uh, this was presumably done prior to that. 25% uh, of all respondents said they complete training outside of work hours because they don't have time for it during their day. Um, when you're grinding to learn as much as you can, you kind of just feel it's your normal life. I can't see it being sustainable for an extended period of time. This is about people having to do their jobs and then learn nights and weekends. I made the same mistake. I didn't code for years afterwards, and I love coding. Weekends and days off are not negotiable. Uh, being burned out is the worst part. Losing passion is even worse. Stay cool, chill. Um, long People have been in this field for a long time. Eventually, either burn out or figure out that they are the only ones who uh, need, can set boundaries that will prevent them from burning out. You know, I try to work a maximum of 50 hours a week, uh, and I try to keep it lower than that. But for the most part, I, I probably end up working close to 50 hours a week. But I won't work more than that, because I know if I do uh, for any extended period of time, it's just not sustainable. I spend tons of time beyond those 50 hours learning. I spend a good chunk of my weekends and evenings learning new things. Uh, I don't consider that work. I love it. I enjoy it. Um, but I don't have much opportunity at work to learn new things, and that frustrates me. Um, but it's, it's hard to be a developer. Uh, another study uh, about, this talks about how developers who have an opportunity to learn through their company feel more valued and are happier. They're also more productive. I think I put it, yeah. So remote employees with training feel more productive, manage their time better, have better communication, and maintain a better balance between their work and personal lives. Those without training from employers are less happy, uh, feel less valued, and uh, are more likely to quit. So yeah, a lot of developers feel like this because they're exhausted. You know, they have very tough jobs, stressful jobs, and then they have to spend weekends and evenings you know, learning to, to do their jobs and to keep up with tech changes. This is really sad. I've only had 
this is in response to the question this morning about your favorite manager and why they're so good. I've only ever had managers who made me dread getting into work. As a result, they've taught me to be the opposite of what they are when I'm in a position of power. Uh, this is Emma Watterson again, uh, it's really good stuff. Developers come by this disdain honestly, having been subjected to the likes of Kevin, who openly wondered why programmers put bugs in their code. Oh, I, this is, I, was, I skipped something here, sorry. I think I... Um, is it bad engineering managers think leadership is about power. Uh, so top-down leadership, where you tell people what to do um, rather than competently serving their team. So uh, a lot of these the managers and executives uh, who have never written code they don't understand the process and the difficulties and the challenges that uh, developers go through. And it would be good if they, they had some empathy and appreciation for the daily life of a developer and the challenges that they faced. And the reasons why developers care so much about things like uh, technical debt and um, autonomy and the ability to sort of uh, make decisions about how to implement things rather than being told exactly what to implement and how to implement it. At multiple tech jobs over the years, I've been bullied, backstabbed, and worse. I've worked at toxic jobs and burned out. I've almost quit the tech industry completely several times. I learned it's on me to constantly reevaluate the risk and reward of a particular situation. I've watched tech chew up and spit out and destroy so many good people of different genders, different races, different abilities. This industry is terrible. Managers might have missed uh, empathy and creativity according to uh, their employees. Um, when employees are asked about their manager's skills, basically three quarters of them said that their managers need more training. Um, so most managers aren't doing a great job. They may think they're doing a great job, but developers probably don't think that, aren't so happy uh, and think that they could do better. Uh, we asked data engineers how they feel about their daily work. 97, oops, I'm hitting the wrong buttons here. 97% reported feeling burned out. 97%. Um, and it's a similar list uh, that we saw earlier from developers. Spending, focusing too much time on errors, uh, constantly playing catch up with stakeholder requests, fast pace of requests, uh, lack of feedback, unreasonable requests, this leads to chronic stress. Uh, Short-term occasional stress is, is totally fine. We're, we're able to deal with it. But uh, this doctor from, this professor slash doctor from Stanford says, chronic stress has been associated with increased biological aging, suppression or abnormal regulation of immune function, impairment of brain structure and function, increased susceptibility to some types of infection and worsening of conditions like depression, heart disease, and some types of cancer. We don't just keel over the minute we start experiencing chronic stress. Uh, psychological and biological resilience mechanisms enable us to keep functioning even when we're under chronic stress. The sad thing is that we can put ourselves under so much chronic stress that even the powerful resilience mechanisms that nature has given us can break down. And this has happened to so many developers. Uh, they just keep pushing and pushing and pushing and eventually they break down. And that is incredibly sad. And when this happens, companies can suffer severe consequences. So uh, this article is talking about a vicious job market feedback loop. Um, if your team is already under lots of feeling lots of pressure to push out features and is feeling that it can't get the job done and one or two developers quits, things get even worse for the developers who are still there and they're more likely to quit as a result. My tech company boomed during the pandemic. Sales were at an all-time high. Everyone was working long hours, nights, weekends, constantly. People quit and there were no backfills. I quit last week, totally burned out. So that's catastrophic success there. The company was doing so well, everyone was completely exhausted. People started quitting and that caused other people to get uh, even more exhausted and more frustrated and they started quitting and, and it's, it's, everyone suffers. Third colleague quit today saying his next gig may not be a tech one and he's taking a very long break. Young man, increasingly thinking this is a trend that has just started. People are exhausted, burned out. 
Some days I wonder how long I'm going to hang on. Want to know what it's like to work in tech? My boss quit Monday, followed by two other co-workers. Now I'm the most senior on my team and have five new employees. I started in January. Teams work nights to meet deadlines. Members burn out or quit. More work is left for remaining team members. The team enters survival mode, building up technical debt. Another vicious cycle is created. A uh, whole article on this topic. <laughs> Employee turnover is incredibly expensive, even under good conditions. On average, uh, this, this study sh suggests that losing a technical employee uh, costs a company one to one and a half years uh, of that developer's salary. Um, incredibly expensive. What are these costs? So one is you got to hire somebody else uh, that, you know, maybe you got to pay a recruiter or whatever it might be. You have to onboard them. That takes time away from other people who could be being productive. Um, and you got to pay them while they're onboarding. You lose productivity. Uh, it can take a year or two for a new developer or even longer, depending on how much technical debt is in your code base. It can take a year or two for the new employee to become as productive as somebody, the person you lost. Um, when developers see their friends and colleagues quit, they can become less excited about the job and they may be more likely to quit as well or to stop working as hard. Customer service problems and, and mistakes uh, lots of you can you can create lead to errors. Uh, training costs. Uh, new employees often need extra training, um, and the culture can change when you lose a developer and you're used to working with that developer, and she leaves. Then the the team culture is changed, and you have to adjust to the new team member who's different. So, most importantly of all, people are what we call an appreciating asset. The longer we stay with an organization, the more productive we get. We learn the systems, we learn the products, and we learn how to work together. And so I don't think, I think too many managers think of tech employees as interchangeable. Oh, you know, if Bob quits, we'll just hire Mary and Mary will do the same job. But the reality is it takes much, a long, long time for Mary to get uh, up to speed with the technology and the culture and the process and, and you know, the all the different aspects of doing the job well and productively. So losing somebody and replacing them, it's not the same thing. <coughs> I mentioned early in this talk that uh, developers care literally nothing more, care about nothing more than being productive and making progress. This is where the article came. This is a Harvard Business uh, School, sorry, Harvard Business Review article uh, where they did the, this is the, just the abstract, but there's a lot of, data underlying this. Nothing contributed more to positive inner work life, the mix of emotions, motivations, and perceptions that's critical to performance, than making progress in meaningful work. If a person is motivated and happy at the end of the workday, it's a good bet he or she achieved something, however small. If the person drags out of the office disengaged and joyless, a setback is likely to blame. Positive feedback loop there's a positive feedback loop between progress and inner work life. So if your developers are every day feel like they're making some progress and accomplishing something meaningful, they're going to feel good about their job and they're going to be more likely to show up the next morning excited to keep going. But the more roadblocks are placed in front of them, uh, the slower that progress gets and the more frustrating it becomes and the less motivated they are to keep going. Uh, if you are constantly feeling like you're getting knocked backwards or, or unable to move forward, it, it, it demotivates you and becomes a, a vicious cycle. In this, this, this is another dimension of, uh, this is from a Google Google analyzed its own teams. It uh, at, at, at used all kind, looked for all kinds of different measures of to try to understand why some teams were so productive. <clears throat> and this is their main conclusion of the five key. Di so they found five ma five things, but one was far and away the most valuable, uh, most the, the the most important element. Of the five key dynamics of effective teams the researchers identified, psychological safety was by far the most important. 
Google researchers found that individuals on teams with higher psychological safety are less likely to leave Google, more likely to harness the power of diverse ideas from their teammates, bring in more revenue, and are rated as effective twice as often by executives. Um, so the, the, you can see below what they consider to be psychological safety, but basically teams where people feel safe to be themselves and to not put up false fronts and to take in, intelligent risks uh, and fail occasionally uh, and to admit their mistakes um, and to, to admit that they don't know something uh, the, or to uh, ask others for help. These sorts of traits make teams successful. This is the number one thing that Google found as most critical for successful teams. And this is exactly the sort of thing that focusing on, you know, which developer uh, pushed through the most Jira points last month uh, breaks down. This is like the opposite of that. Um, so intelligent management can, can build real high quality, high performance teams uh, if they understand these, these basic fundamental facts about what makes teams successful. Oops, I went, sorry, wrong, okay. Uh, from a New York Times article also about Google's analysis of its own employees and, and performance. Another dimension, on the good teams, members spoke in roughly the same proportion, a phenomenon researchers refer to as equality in distribution of, of conversational turn-taking. So over time, you don't have certain people dominating the conversation and certain people not talking at all. You have everybody sharing their perspectives, speaking up, asking questions, um, and, and that, that sort of team is most likely to be a successful, high productivity, happy team. Second, good teams all had high average social sensitivity, a fancy way of saying they were skilled at intuiting how others felt based on their tone, tone of voice, expressions, and nonverbal cues. So people on successful teams <clears throat> are able to read the other people on their team and they, they understand what they're thinking and feeling. For the first time in my life, I've got a small amount saved and I'm so burned out on my technology, my industry tech, it sucks ass. I literally can't afford both insurance and rent if I take a break for even a few months. And I'm one of the fortunate ones. So this is, this is, uh, this, uh, to wrap up, the, I'm gonna go through a few more tweets about from developers who are just so frustrated with technology. We can and should do better. Uh, we know how to do better. It's not that difficult. Uh, it's just having more empathy for developers, granting them more autonomy, not putting them under tremendous time pressure, letting them you know, avoid severe technical debt. These sorts of things can make developers so much happier and in the long term, so much more productive. But I wanna, I wanna go back and read through a few more tweets. Um, so you, we, because this is about, the, the, this first talk is about uh, the frustrations that developers feel. So rage quitting tech is, it's almost like a cottage industry writing tweets about rage quitting tech. So practicing for when we rage quit tech and become goat farmers. After I rage quit tech, you'll find me here. It's an Austin Powers theme park, which actually exists in Australia. Seriously, I don't know why the last six months have been absolutely fucking brutal for everyone I know in tech. I don't know if it's the isolation and working from home thing, getting really old or something else, but I've never been this burned out and stressed out. So the reply, the tech industry needs a fucking vacation. We need to be sustainable. We can be sustainable, but that means it just we can't constantly be sprinting. Jira is all about two week sprints. You sprint, then you sprint again. You sprint again after that. Yep, my mistake. Oh, and so managers have a tough time too. It's it's not. I thought that becoming a manager, I could make everything great for my team. But managers exist in a cultural and organizational context, and that puts constraints on managers as well. And uh, some quotes from some some managers and former managers. My mistake joining a management heavy company so early on. I ended up supervising three interns. Uh, so much glue work, my tech skills plateaued, and then I burned out and took three months leave. Good times. I did a good job as a manager uh, based on what my reports have said, but it burned me out and made me quit, so I'm hesitant to try again. I think being a tech lead at Google, especially at higher levels, will let me do some of what I liked managing. 
Me at 25. All my tech bosses have sucked. Calculating how good I have to be at something else to quit. Me at 47. I'm the tech boss and I make sure no one that works for me at 25 will ever feel that way. I hit this point in March this year. Burnout. Quit my manager job in May and have been unwinding the mild burnout since. I think managers are used to putting up with more BS so they can hold out longer than individual contributors. Uh, burnout in tech is finally starting to hit managers, their managers, and their managers hard. Quote from a VP of engineering. After one and a half years of 15 to 20 Zoom meetings a day, I hit my limit and can't do it anymore. I'm taking the rest of the year to recover. Until now, most companies have been mostly concerned with individual contributor burnout. Uh, it was assumed senior managers who get paid more and have more vested interest in equity would deal with deal with stuff themselves. The fact these people are quitting is a huge warning sign. Senior management quitting with nothing, no job lined up means leaving a lot of money on the table. It means it's very bad. Any of my followers aspiring CTOs, I'd love to talk. Chad, man, two months as a mere tech lead nearly burned me out. Speak not to me of CTO hood. Here's the thing, tech Twitter. I'm burned out and I have been for months. I just massively unfollowed like 800 tech accounts because I'm really struggling to find joy in hacking. I'm going to spend uh, more time making art and much less talking about InfoSec. Burnout is unfortunately a common thing in the tech industry. I'm now seeing people burned out from just interviewing for tech jobs. Come on, tech. We're supposed to be a hopeful place, making the world better and all that shit. If you made it all the way to the end of this talk, thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Or should I say tech talk? Um, I think this is a really important uh, issue. I think it's a really huge opportunity for the industry and for many, many companies. I think we can, it's a win-win opportunity. We can make developers happy while also boosting productivity of the highly paid developers that uh, team, companies employ um, by appreciating the costs of technical debt and appreciating developer efforts to prevent it from accumulating and pay it down to so that we can uh, keep our velocity up uh, rather than simply measuring velocity in real time uh, we, can, we can all benefit and uh, any tech execs especially who have stayed this far thank you so much for I hope I hope uh, you found this useful uh, and I hope it makes a positive difference uh, in, in your company. Uh, part two will cover um, largely JIRA uh, and JIRA-like processes that try to manage through um, points or other ways of uh, counting how much work gets done. It's not a bad or good approach, but there are pros and cons, especially of the sort of default Industry-wide default seems to be a sort of heavy scrum process uh, in conjunction with uh, uh, Jira, and that isn't necessarily the best approach. It's not the original vision of Agile that the people who created the Agile manifesto had in mind, and we'll go into all of that, and um, we'll discuss lighter weight approaches like Kanban in part two. In part three, we'll become uh, we'll, we'll we'll go proactive and try to put to get, share a vision for a a way of doing development that enables cultures to be sustainable over time, uh, enabling developers to grow and learn and help each other improve both individually and collectively. Uh, to build code bases that are maintainable and extensible so that velocity always stays good rather than um, in the short term looks good, but in the long term uh, grinds to a halt. And we will see how empowering tech teams not only uh, produces higher value uh, in terms of deliverables, but also creates a hiring and retention advantage for the firm. Companies where developers are happy and are productive are also the sorts of places where other developers want to come and developers are very reluctant to leave for other opportunities. Uh, so again, thank you for taking the time to spend an hour with me. 
and I hope to see you back for part two.